now what we're going to do, now that we've talked about how to pass parameters, now we talked about how to give code to a thread, let's talk about how threads actually run under the hood. And we'll, <laughs> we'll cover this now with enough information to get you the big picture. And then later in the course, we're going to go into much, much more detail about how threads work. But that'll come a lot later, because you don't need to know those details at this point yet. So when a thread is started and begins to run, there's actually a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And it's kind of important to understand this, because uh, if you don't appreciate the fact that there's a lot of work happening under the scenes, you'll create a lot of threads in your code, which will consume a lot of resources and make everything run slowly, which is counterintuitive often. So I want to quickly give you an overview of this. When we talk about managing the Java thread lifecycle much later in the class, I'll, I'll cover this in a lot more detail. So there's actually multiple layers involved. The, the hardware is involved. The operating system kernel is involved. Various C system libraries are involved. System libraries written in C. The Java execution environment, the Java virtual machine, the Android runtime, and so on. That's involved. And then finally, there are threading and synchronization packages that are also involved. So there's many different layers. And I'll actually walk through a little trace later in the course showing about you know, 15 methods that get invoked one way or another when you call start on a thread. Interestingly enough, when you create a new thread object, when you make an instance of a new thread object, it doesn't actually allocate anything at that point. It just makes kind of the wrapper at that stage. So if you say, you know, new thread, my thread or whatever, it'll make a new object, but there won't be a lot of resources assembled at that point. That happens when you call start. So when you call start on an allocated thread object, that's what really sets things in motion. And so what that'll do at that point is that'll go ahead and allocate that runtime stack and all the other registers into something typically called a thread control block or whatever. And the bulk of that information resides in the operating system kernel, although there will also be other sort of ancillary state involved with thread objects that are further up the stack, not in the kernel itself. After everything's up and running, after we've got a thread stack here, the Java execution environment will arrange to invoke the run hook method where your user provided code will be invoked. So that's the code you supplied, as we had discussed earlier, either through extending thread or by implementing runnable. And that's where the fun stuff begins. And that's, that's a hook method. A hook method is just a method that gets called back. It's a virtual method that gets called back as part of a framework. So this is an example of a framework. Once the thread begins to run, it can run concurrently and block independently of other threads that are in the system. So typically, if you create a thread, you're already in a thread, often the main thread. It doesn't have to be the main thread, but often you're in the main thread. So once, those, that, once that secondary thread is started, then it can run and it can block independently of what other threads, including its caller thread, happen to do. And of course, that's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it allows us to run things at the same time on multiple cores, thereby perhaps speeding up the program. It's a curse because then you have to be concerned with synchronizing and coordinating the behaviors between the separate threads if they happen to share information, especially mutable state. The code that you run in a thread is often um, sort of user to, up to the user to define what you want to do. There's sometimes restrictions. We'll talk more about those later. But basically, the code that runs is in the run hook method. And, and most generally, any kind of code you run there, there are some restrictions. If you are running on a platform like Android and you're running background threads, those background threads have certain limits. They can't, for example, um, do certain things. So here's an example. If you're on the Android platform, code running in a background thread can't access user interface toolkit components. So you can't talk to the user from a background thread. And if you want to talk to the user, you have to send a message back to the user interface thread, and it'll talk to the user on your behalf. So it's sort of like a proxy for the, uh, the background threads. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. That's not important right now. And this is a very, very common restriction in windowing toolkits. And you can read more about how Android handles that by looking at this link. And we'll talk more about this later. Uh, so only the user interface thread on Android can access the GUI components and interact with the user. <laughs> 
as long as the run hook method is running, as long, let me rephrase that, as long as the run hook method hasn't returned <laughs> or bailed out or whatever, terminated, then the thread will run. Now, uh, this is an interesting issue because the thread may be logically running, but the operating system can suspend it periodically when its scheduling quantum has elapsed. So if it runs for more than, let's say, 100 milliseconds or whatever the scheduling quantum is on the, the operating system, then the operating system will typically suspend the thread automatically and promote some other thread and let it run, if there's other threads to run. Uh, so that's part of the operating system thread scheduling mechanism. And your Java threads really can't do much about that. You just have to be aware of the fact that you aren't always running necessarily full tilt. But the thread will remain alive as long as the thread hasn't exited from the run method. So this is just pointing out that during the life cycle of a thread, it may be suspended and resumed many times by the underlying operating system scheduler and virtual machine and execution environment and so on and so forth. So there may be times when the thread is paused or suspended, but it, it'll still be alive. These thread scheduling operations are largely invisible to your code. You just have to be aware that they could take place. And, and why this matters is because you have to make sure that you program with synchronization mechanisms that are aware of the fact that threads may be asleep and in ways that you have no control over. So that, that becomes much more important when we get into thread scheduling. If you want a thread to run forever, of course, nothing runs forever. Uh, but if you want it to run for a, a long time till you shut it down through some other means, then you simply have to use some kind of infinite loop, like while true. There's other ways to do it, but that's one approach. And that'll just keep running until something, typically an external monitor or an end user, comes along and says, OK, that's it. I'm done. Clicks the cancel button, or a timer goes off, or something. Right? There's ways to shut things down if they run for too long. After the run method returns, the thread is no longer alive. It's, it's dead, or it's not alive. And there's a couple of different ways that that can happen. One way that can happen is for the thread to just end normally. So it may run for a while, and then if some condition is true, we might return. So that's a normal termination. Another way for this to happen is for there to be some kind of exception thrown that is not caught in the scope of the run method. So if an exception is thrown and run doesn't catch the exception, then the thread will be terminated abnormally. Those of you who are taking the class for grad credit for programming assignment number 1A have to set an uncaught exception handler to warn you if an exception has been percolated out of your run method that was not caught. Even if you're an undergrad, you might want to put that in there because it's a good debugging tool in case things go awry, which they very well may, because otherwise it's hard to track down programs that, that don't keep track of uncaught exceptions. There's several different ways of dealing with the results of threads exiting. The most, what one way, we'll talk about two ways. One way is to join with them. So what you do there is if some thread starts another thread, then it might do some things for a while and then call join on the thread that it started. And in that case, join will simply block until the thread it's waiting for finishes, either abnormally or normally. So that's what join does. This is what's called a, a very, very simple form of barrier synchronization. So it'll basically say, you know, wait until this other thread has reached a certain point, and then you can continue on with your computation. Uh, as you start looking at assignment 1A, you will see that there's a great need and, in fact, a requirement for you to implement this type of barrier synchronization. And um, please make sure you watch the video I put up that describes, kind of walks through the skeletons. Another thing, I had a great question in office hours today about um, the acquire and uh, was acquire, palantir, and gaze method that's in the simple being runnable class. <laughs> and uh, I posted a little tip you need to go take a look at the try finally feature of Java. And try finally is a cool feature that says, do the code in the try block. And no matter what happens, if it returns normally or if it has an exception, make sure the code in the finally block 
of the try finally construct always gets wrong. And you need to do that to make sure that you always release the Palantir, even if an exception is thrown. Yes? For this particular case, try finally does the trick. If there was something you were going to do with, an ex with a certain type of exception, then a try catch could be fine. But in this case, we don't care about what the exception was. We just know that we don't want to uh, exit that scope without releasing the Palantir. You can also, of course, have try catch finally too. But in this case, try finally will do the trick for you. So yeah, good question. So take a look at that. And uh, feel free to come to office hours or post other questions if you have other issues with that. The other way you can handle thread termination is just to evaporate, just to disappear. So in that case, you, nobody's joining. The thread just goes away. And once it's evaporated, then the Java execution environment can reclaim the thread and reuse its resources. And the operating system kernel can reclaim the runtime stack and the registers for use with some other thread that may be allocated at some other time. So basically, it'll clean up thread-specific storage, the runtime stack of activation records, and so on and so forth. So that's an overview of how threads run. As I mentioned before, later in the course, probably much later towards the end of the course, I'll go through the mechanisms of what threads do under the hood. And you'll get to learn about the states that threads are in and see all the different layers are involved and so on. But that's overkill at this point.